We've spent a lot of time getting dialed in on classification models, but what happens when you want to predict a continuous numeric value? It's time to leave the nest and enter the world of regression models. Welcome back to AI Basics, as we take a deeper dive into model types, this time looking at regression models. You use a regression model to predict a continuous numeric value, such as price, temperature, height, blood pressure, etc. Although in reality, there is always a finite number of values that you can record in any measurement, if your variable has more than 10 or so potential values, such as the weight range of humans measured to the nearest pound or kilogram, a classification model is not going to produce a result with any amount of predictive skill. That is where a regression model comes into play. A regression model essentially approximates a continuous function, where given the feature inputs of your data, the function produces a numeric output. This is easiest to visualize with simple linear regression, where given a single input on the x-axis, like the number of rooms in a house, the model outputs the y-value on a straight line, representing the predicted selling value of that house. However, you aren't limited to a single input with regression. You can have dozens or even millions of inputs and have a model that produces one or more predicted outputs. Let's open a notebook and put one together. Okay, instead of starting from scratch, I'm going to use a template that I've created. And this is based on a lot of the work that we've done in previous videos. Now the regression model that we're going to build is going to be based on some wine data. And I've got it here off of Kaggle's website. Essentially, the data set contains a bunch of chemical measurements on different varieties of wine. These include acidity, sugars, etc. And then at the end, there's a column called quality, which rates the wine with a score between 0 and 10. So the idea would then be if you have a new glass of wine and you took all of these measurements, could you then predict its quality? Now what's interesting about this data set is that you could build either a classification model or a regression model. A lot of people have taken that score between 0 and 10 and just created a couple of categories, such as poor, good, and excellent. And so they would just break up that value between 1 and 10 into each of those categories. That then becomes a classification model. We're going to use it as a regression model, where we're going to try and calculate where on that range between 0 and 10 each row would fall. So you can download this data set. I've got this URL in the description. I've done that already, and I've got it all in my data directory. So they've got both a red wine and a white wine data set. And then there's a little bit of information in this names file. So what I'm going to do is create a copy of my template and just save it as, and I'll just call it wine quality. And let's get started putting together our regression model. So let's just clean a few things up here on the template. I'll put a title in here of wine quality prediction and a little bit of a description, predict wine quality through linear regression. All right, I've got some imports already set up for us. So we're importing pandas and also the pandas profiling library. I've also from scikit-learn imported cross-validate, which will allow us to uh, create our metrics based on our model. What I haven't done yet is imported the actual models themselves. So I put a URL here that lists all of the different models that are available. And here they are on scikit-learn. So here's logistic regression. We're going to do a linear regressor, and we want linear regression. So that's the name of the library that we will import. Come back here, and from sklearn dot linear model, I'm going to import linear regression. Okay, so I've imported everything. 
Then I'll read my data set and I'll create a profile report so I can take a quick look at all the data. So I just have everything generically named here. I'm going to call my data frame wine and I'm going to read the table. Notice I'm using the generic library as opposed to read CSV. If I take a look at the data, I can see that it's definitely delimited, but it's delimited by a semicolon as opposed to a comma. So I need to make sure that I note that when I do the import. So I'll read the table. It's going to be in my data directory. It's called wine quality dash red dot txt and the separator get rid of the comma and make it a semicolon let me just comment out the profile report here and make sure that it imports okay looks like i got an error here and that's just because my notebook is in the same directory as my template so let me just close this and move this into my wine regression directory and reopen it. There we go. So I've imported that. Let me just take a quick look at it. I always like to have a console open here. And there we go. So everything's looking good. There's my quality column and then here's all the inputs. All right, well now we're ready to run our profile report. So I just need to run it on my data set. And we'll let that run for just a second. Okay, that did take a little while. I just didn't want you to have to sit through it. But here is our profile report. We won't go through it in a ton of detail, but a few things I do want to look at are these warnings. There's a number of duplicate rows that we should probably get rid of. Also have a bunch of zeros, which we need to really research and see is that, does that mean that that particular wine actually does have a value of zero or is that missing data that they've replaced with zeros? Okay, I don't have any missing data, so that's good. And so let's just move on. So we've taken care of missing values and things like that in other videos, so I'm not going to uh, go through that in detail here. I'd rather just go through the modeling portion. Next, the template has us setting up our data and breaking it into our feature matrix and our predictor column. So all I need to do is substitute this with our data frame name and then put in the predictor column. which as we mentioned earlier is called quality. Okay, so I'll break those up. Got another DF somewhere, there it is. Okay. And now we're ready to train our model. We just need to set up the different metrics that we're going to measure. So we did that earlier by creating a list and we just uh, name our models. This is so that our table looks nice. So I'll just call this linear regression and the model API is what's actually going to run. And back up at the top, that's called linear regression. And I have the API for that. Actually, we'll go back here. If we look at linear regression, there's a number of different hyperparameters that we can set. That would be something that we would optimize a little bit later. So we'll just leave all the defaults. And if we were gonna run additional models and compare them, we would just append those on here as well. Then we have to fill in the list of the different metrics that we're going to measure. And so going back to this page that we saw in our other video, which I also have posted in the description, if we go down and look at regression, there are quite a few different metrics that we could use. 
The first one that we'll work with is R2 or R squared as it's typically called. And this has similarities to the accuracy metric that we used when we were doing classification. Of course, it's not the only metric. It's not necessarily the best metric, but it's a good one to get started because it's normalized to a value between zero and one. One, of course, being the best or the most accurate and zero being the least accurate. So that is called R2. And we'll fill that in here. I'm not going to have a second metric, so we'll just leave that at one. And then in our resulting report, we'll just have some column names. Maybe I'll call this model and metric one will be R squared. And metric two, I think I'll just do the uh, standard deviation of R squared, just so I can see how close they are. Since we're doing tenfold cross validation, I want to see how close those are to each other amongst the tenfolds. So we'll average R2, and then we'll take the standard deviation across all 10. Okay, and then our loop is ready to go. It's going to read the model off of this list. It's going to use our data that we have pre-split and it's going to score based on our list of metrics, which is the R squared value. It'll train the model, and then it's going to post the results into that table. And, you know, I think I'll just put this back to name since everything else kind of points to that. So it'll put the name of the model in the name column. In the R squared column, it will put the results of R2 take its mean, and then in the third column, it will put the standard deviation in there, which is also the R2 metric, but the standard deviation of that. Okay, that should work. Let's run it. And there's our result. Okay, so we ran linear regression. We got an R squared value of 0.23, which is not good at all. So we either need to do some work with the data which we would definitely start with and try out. Or if we can't get it to improve much more than this, we would probably abandon this project. So we definitely want this number to improve. A lot of people like to see our squared values around the 0.8 range, but it really does matter on the use case. I've seen good models as low as 0.4. So there are a lot of different things that we could do and our profile report can give us some of those clues if I look at correlations, for example, there's a couple of fields that are correlated to each other, and that might be causing some overfitting. So we might want to get rid of one or the other of those. So red means that they're negatively correlated. So fixed acidity is highly linear correlated with pH, also correlated with density. And then these that are towards the darker blue, citric acid, and acidity are correlated quite a bit, and sulfur dioxide is somewhat. So I may want to think about um, only having one of each of those in my model and getting rid of the others. Also, again, if I uh, bring up that console, and look at the values of each of my columns, I can see that some of them have fairly large integers like total sulfur dioxide has values, you know, between, I'm guessing, 0 and 100. Density is probably between 0 and 1. And a lot of these have uh, small floating point values versus larger integer values. This was the case with our breast cancer data earlier. And lucky for us, what someone had done ahead of time was they re-normalized all this data so that each one of these columns was normalized to a value between 0 and 10. And that really helped the model. So we could do the same thing here. And there are pandas libraries that allow us to do that. So that's another thing that I would attempt to do before abandoning this. It would probably give us some better results. But that gets us started on linear regression. Main thing was I wanted to show you how you can take advantage of a template and just fill in a couple of values and have it do all the work for us. As you can see, you build regression models the same way you build classification models. They just have different evaluation metrics. Because they have been around for so long, they are very well understood. 
So although they are not as fancy as GPU-trained neural networks, they are still often the go-to model for regulated industries such as healthcare when you need to explain why your model makes a specific decision. We'll continue to look at other model types in the next few videos. Let us know in the comments how you've used linear regression, and I'll see you in the next video.